What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. We're going to talk about what is a secured party creditor. That is not what you want to be. Do not believe what people are telling you out there on the internet. Uh, in fact, you will never find these three words anywhere in law. Um, the secured party creditor process is something that comes from the, well, the study, right? It's, it's coming from the Uniform Commercial Code. And in that commercial code, you will never find these three words, secured party creditor, at all in anywhere in, the, in those books or teachings. Nor will you find it in any proper law dictionary, um, 1933 and older, nothing in the 1800s, nothing published with these three words. There is only a secured party and a debtor. That is it. And then you have the collateral. We're going to talk about exactly what it is, where it came from, why it does not work, and and what is the process that goes with it. Inside of the Patreon course, you're going to find how we teach everything to go completely against this. It, it doesn't work, and I'm going to show you within the Uniform Commercial Code why it says certain aspects of the secure party creditor process and why it doesn't work at all. But first, before we go into that, I want to show you a video that was sent to me uh, on my one of my TikTok feeds, uh, someone had sent me a video. Um, this channel here, I don't know who this man is or what, but he's talking about uh, one important popular document that is within the secure party creditor space called the UCC one, and he's stating that it is the end all be all for doing a process which allows you to control your estate as the secured party creditor using that form and that form alone which is not true so i'm going to play some of his video and i'll pause it and i'll talk about it and then we'll get into some other things one document preparation course gaining control and ownership of your straw man by filing a ucc1 financing statement does two things first you gain limited control over the funds in the account Secondly, by properly filing... Let's stop there. Okay. First, he's saying that by you filing a UCC1 document, a financing statement, which I will show, that you can gain control over the funds in a particular account. Now, I'm sure you probably have seen, or you may have not, all over the internet, people are saying that your social security card is a checking account, and the number is on the back of the card, uh, is some form of a routing number that's going to the Federal Reserve. And there are monies available to you in that account that they are not telling you about, otherwise known as Treasury Direct Accounts, TDA accounts. That is false. So many people have caught charges for tampering with those numbers and trying to utilize it. It is false to believe that there is some type of hidden trust uh, that's in your name that you have access to. There is a trust, but it is not for you to access. There's a way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And so far, everyone who's tried to do it according to what the government has said to do it, because they have put out protocols and procedures and people have followed it and they have caught charges and they are serving time. Stay away from using these numbers in any way, such as going online to try to pay a bill or anything like that. It's not gonna work. If it goes through, it's just going to reverse and stay away from it. It's not worth your time. So there's no such thing as a TDA account that you have access to by doing a simple UCC1. I will show you the law where it tells you straight up that that does not work. UCC1 financing statement. You become the holder in due course of your straw man. A filed UCC1 is public notice of a registered lien by a real human being who is the secured party over the straw man. Okay, he's saying that a UCC1 is public notice. There are different liens out there because a UCC1 is a financing statement and it is considered a type of lien. If I were to go here in California to the Secretary of State's office where I would like to file a lien, maybe I want to put a lien on someone that I've given money to or maybe I want to put a lien on a business that my trust owns, I would come here to do that, 
right? Now, this is the state level. You also have liens on the county level. Now, the counties are what's called a micro republic. They are they hold a much higher seat than anything above them, such as state and federal. The counties is where the power is at. So I would say the county, based on the UCC law, the county is where you want to file your initial UCCs there. And they're not called a UCC1. But for now, if I wanted to do this and file a UCC1 here through the Secretary of State, I would click File a Lien, and they're going to tell me what kind. Here you have a financing statement, UCC1. This is what's called a Notice of Lien. It is not the initial organic lien. It is just a notice. And this is done on the state level. Why is the notice done on the state level? Because the real one is supposed to be done in the micro republic, the organic public record, which is in the county. Here you see a notice of judgment lien. This is something that you were issued from the winnings of a court case. If you win against someone, the court will give you a judgment. You can file that judgment lien here with the Secretary of State to enforce the monies that you were awarded from whichever business lost against a suit against you, right? You would file that there. An attachment lien. These are the much smaller liens, such as mechanic liens. If someone is doing work on your property and you didn't pay them, they would go and file something down at the county, and then they will reference that here with the Secretary of State as an attachment lien. That's all you have here with the Secretary of State. Now, what is he saying? He's saying that your UCC-1 is the end-all, be-all, and that's not the case. Which is the government-created foreign non-registered corporation. With the straw man under your control, government has no access to your straw man, and they also lose their connection to the real living man or women in connection. That is not true. The government is a federal corporation. Yes, it is. It, uh, it started that way since its inception, and it has always been that way. Even on the Republic, it was a corporation, and even on now as a de facto uh, democratic, it is still a corporation. It always will be. That's what it was created to do. It has also created sub-corporations, such as your first, middle, last name, referenced by the birth certificate and the social security number. Your birth certificate is what's called a certificated security. And from that certificated security, you then get uncertificated security, such as your social security card. Now, Filing this UCC-1 notice of lien, uh, he's stating that it will block these governments from accessing your accounts and doing all kind of crazy mischief towards you. That's not true. There are two sides to your, he's calling it a straw man. The real lawful Latin legal term is ens legis, E-N-S, and the next word is legis, L E. G I S, hands legis. And so there are two sides to that. One side is the debtor and the other side is the creditor. How do you know which one you're, you're dealing with? The debtor side is the first, middle, last name and all capital letters, right? The creditor side is last name, comma, first name, middle. Both of them are debtors. Both of them are still a part of this ends legis. One's the creditor side and one is the debtor side. When you open a bank account, you have two ledgers that are open. What can happen is when you create an express trust to be the secured party, the secured party, the express trust will control both sides. See, in trust, it's all about Control everything, but own nothing. Let the trust own it. That removes liability from you, but you control it. Okay. Keep that in mind. Let's continue. Once you take possession of your straw man, you are no longer a subject. You become a free and sovereign. And once again, you declare your independence. 
to perfect a lien against personal property, such as one used in a business, a uniform. You declare your independence by doing a UCC one, not true. A UCC one does not do all of this. There are other things and other methods that you have to do with the courts. I'm going to show you. Well, let me just say it, and I want you to look this up. To properly declare your status, you have to first go back to where the problem began. You have a birth certificate. And with that birth certificate, they tell you that you are a US citizen. Nowhere on your birth certificate does it say the United States. It only says the state in which you were born. So therefore you are a national of that nation. I was born in California. I am a Californian national. I am not a US citizen based on my birth certificate. So on the birth certificate, you have what's called the registrar. This is the person who registers your birth within the land records or the miscellaneous records, but most likely it's the real estate section. You are registered in the same section that certificates of title are registered when it comes to owning property to your house. Why? Because you come from the earth. You really do. Our bodies is mostly water and, and we're, when we die, we will return back to dust. It's, it really does get that deep when it comes to this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but on the birth certificate, you have the registrar and the registrar is the one who's registering your information down at the county. So you have to go back to the county to fix the problem. The registrar in law, he is what's called he or she, your county registrar or county recorder's office, the recorder clerk, they are considered an immigrational officer within a naturalization court. The counties is where naturalization begins. Before we had the US CIS departments for foreign nationals coming over and becoming a US citizen, they would go directly to the county offices and declare their intentions of being here, their, their business of being here and their nationality. And before you, they would come here and say, look, I'm a Venezuelan national or a Colombian national, uh, a German national coming to the United States to do business. And that's it. They didn't turn over their uh, citizenship or their nationality. You have to do the very same thing if you really want to change your status. And the way you do that is through filing your express trust, registering the express trust down at the county. That does not mean you are surrendering your rights or anything like that. Registration and recording is not giving over uh, some type of rights like a license. Is not the case because an express trust is a contract. And within that contract, you are going to state who you are, why you are that, and you must state the actual law that says you can do that. The law is Public Law 94-241, Section 302. Look it up. It tells you how to declare who you are on this land as a national. You would then use that recorded information that is sealed with the registrar and add this as an attachment to your passport application inside of the application of the acts or conditions section. It talks about you providing what's called an explanatory statements. Your county recorded information will serve that purpose. And that's how you correct your status. Inside of the Patreon course, you see exactly how we do that. You'll see the templates, how to word it, and how to be precise with it. So a UCC1 does not do all of that. Okay, I don't know if this man here is, is genuine, if he's actually working on behalf of the government, or if he's just misled. I don't know. It could be all of the above. But we have to correct this information if you're trying to go down this route, if you so choose. Uh, there are major benefits to doing that. But if you so choose, you at least do it the correct way and be well informed. So let's continue. 
Municipal Code Form 1, also known as the UCC-1, must be executed and filed either in the Secretary of State's office or the county courthouse, depending on the state. Once recorded, the UCC-1 makes the lien valid and serves as a notice that the lien exists in most situations. The UCC-1 does not make the lien valid. Filing the UCC-1 in the state's office or the county's office does not make it valid. There is a certain item that you must select on the UCC-1 to make it valid, to make it an initial lien. Remember, there is an initial lien first in the county. Then you have a UCC-1 on the state level. That's the order of operation. It's the first to record a lien takes priority. The Uniform Commercial Code or UCC-1 package covers the basic requirements for filing Uniform Commercial Code documents with the Secretary of State's office or the county courthouse, depending on the state. The Uniform Commercial Code or UCC-1 package includes information on the online fee, payment options, and instructions for Okay, another part. He's talking about additional documents that goes with the UCC-1. When it comes to perfecting a lien, there are documents that you have to have besides just this UCC-1 cover letter, right? And this is the whole reason why the secure party creditor process is a farce. They are missing the big picture, right? Now, I've studied under uh, many different teachers, including Jonah Bay. You can go check him out. But, and he's studied from others before him. So this information is coming from um, that line. Um, now, when you look at why the secure party creditor process doesn't work. I want you to think about it like real estate because it's very simple to understand. Everybody knows when you go fill out an application to get approved for a loan, they approve you, you go and put your deposit down, you go to escrow table, you sign a promissory note and you sign the deed. You don't get the deed until the promissory note has been fulfilled, right? Until the promissory note is fulfilled, the bank is holding the deed as collateral to take the house in case you don't pay, therefore they will foreclose, right? That deed serves as a title to the house. The promissory note serves as um, a promise, a promise to pay in order for you to get the title. Well, you have to do the very same thing if you want to have your trust to have a higher standing over this invisible government trust that is over your straw man or ins legis, they don't have a promissory note from you that says they can do what they do, but you have to have one that your trust has over the ins legis. That makes your trust the real lien holder to an asset or property. What I'm saying is your trust needs to have an actual promissory note. And the deed is the certificate of title. And what is the certificate of title when it comes to the deed to you? Your birth certificate. You will authenticate the birth certificate. It is a certificate of title. Proof of that. Let's go to the only rule in any state, which is Minnesota. Minnesota Rule 220. They're talking about birth certificates and what the registrar of titles, that is the recorder's office, the registrar that's on your birth certificate, he, the, he or she is called the registrar of titles and they are authorized to receive for registration of memorials upon any outstanding certificate of title, which is what? an official birth certificate. See, your birth certificate is a certificate of title to who? To you, the affiant that's gonna be in the affidavit stating that they are 18 years or older, reaching the age of majority. So you will authenticate the birth certificate. You will provide an affidavit of claim of ownership on there stating basically this entire paragraph, get it notarized, and get that authenticated as well, the affidavit on every level of government. Then you will re refer to that on your actual lien and down at the county. So what is this UCC-1? It's time to look at that. What does that look like? 
what I want to go to is Universal UCC Forms. That will take us directly to it. Zoom out here. UCC financing statement. So that is the basic name of this document that we're looking at. UCC financing statement. You have two categories here. First one is the debtor section. Second one is the debtor section. The third is secured party. How come it doesn't say secured party creditor? Here's why. And this is where they're confused. Your trust, it will be considered a secured party. And what makes your trust a creditor over the debtors is the fact that the trust holds a real promissory note lien over the debtor, which makes the trust a creditor over the debtor. See, first it is a secure party. It then becomes a creditor when it holds a promissory note a real promissory note that is to be recorded in the county. That is how it works. That's how it works. What is gonna be listed in the collateral? Of course, the certificate of title that was authenticated. And there's other things that you can list here, your uh, other property, your vehicles, your uh, different automobiles, different, uh, even your children's birth certificates. There's a way to do that. We're gonna talk about how to do the UCC for yourself as an adult and how to do that for your children that are 18 and below. So that way, if you have to go through the court system or I remember uh, the, the mentor Jonah Bay talking about his experience uh, when he was in court, uh, his, his children were in school and there was some type of altercation and they had to go to court for that. I believe in his archives, he does have the audio for you to hear how it went down in the court, which is very interesting. And um, basically, the authentication process for his children and himself and utilizing trust is how he was able to avoid the rules of the Administrative Procedures Act uh, against him and his property. He avoided all of that. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Those are the methods that do work, okay? And you want to stick to something that works, stick to the rules, stick to the actual laws of the book, not something that was passed down because everyone else is doing it and they're not getting remedy. That's, that's what you're gonna find within the secure party creditor uh, space. No remedy. You may find hit or miss one or two things that goes through, but believe me, that's by design to make you think that that's the way when you're really off. Now, this form, if you fill it out correctly, it can play two roles. The first role, as the gentleman said, a UCC-1. This is a UCC-1, a notice of lien, if you leave this little box unchecked here in 6B. If you leave this unchecked, it is a regular UCC-1 notice of lien. But if you check it, it then becomes the initial real organic lien. This is the first step. Here's another thing that you find wrong with the secure party creditor process. In box 6A, public finance transaction is an option. Manufactured home transaction is another option. And finally, a debtor is a transmitting utility. Most of the people, well, actually all of them in the SPC world are selecting a debtor is a transmitting utility. Why would you do that? Did you read the UCC to understand what a transmitting utility is? You have selected that and you've placed your name as a debtor in box 1A. You've also placed the same name in box 2. And you've also placed the same name in box three. You made your name into a trust. This is what you're gonna find. There is no anonymity here, but a transmitting utility 
is an actual utility company. Electricity, water, power, Edison, all of that. When you look it up, and we're going to do that right now. Look at the definitions. UCC, definitions, transmitting utility. And you tell me if this applies to you. It's number 23 of the actual UCC law. Let's zoom in a little bit. It says a transmitting utility means an entity that owns, operates, or controls facilities used for the transmission of electric energy. A, in interstate commerce. B, for the sale of electric energy at wholesale. Now, some people have tried to misunderstand mis um, this thing as the matrix where they turned you into a battery. Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm electric energy. So this applies to me. No, it just said one that owns, operates and controls a facility. You're not that. You don't control the faci a facility of a transmission of electric energy. That does not apply. Now, I wanna to go to section article 9-311. Let's clarify this once and for all. Does a UCC1 filing make your process the end all be all? Here we go. And in order to do that, we're talking about perfection of security interest in properties subject to certain statutes, regulations, and treaties. Number one, A, except as otherwise provided in subsection D, the filing of a financing statement is not necessary or effective to perfect a security interest in property. The filing of a financing statement is not necessary or effective to perfect a security interest in property. So, what is he talking about? Is he misinformed? Or is he purposely trying to deceive? Could be all of the above. Let's continue. So, a filing of a financing statement is not necessary or effective. Subject to what? Number one, a statute a regulation or treaty of the United States whose requirements of a security interest obtaining priority over the rights of a lien creditor with respect to the property preempt section 9-310A. Number two, subject to list any statute covering automobiles, trailers, mobile homes, boats, farm tractors, or the like, and the like is covering gold, silver, precious commodities, uh, your home, real property, which provides for a security interest to be indicated on a certificate of title, like we said. The like is also talking about your birth because that is a security interest to be indicated on a certificate of title as a condition or result of perfection any non-uniform commercial code central filing. That is what we just discovered. Right? The marking of in box 6B, non-uniform commercial code filing. You have to check this box. That is how you perfect anything that is connected to a certificate of title, which Minnesota rule 220 just said, the birth certificate is a certificate of title. Now, why are we authenticating? Because it makes it on par with the original that the county will not give you. That's why we do it. Now, We'll finish up what he was talking about. Each type of UCC filing, 
The instructions describe the data fields and informational requirements for each filing. A UCC1 records and protects a secure party's interest in the collateral offered by a debtor for a loan. In essence, the UCC1 gives public notice relative to the debtor, also known as the secured party relationship, and the collateral involved in the transaction. A UCC1 filing is effective for five years, and it can be renewed through a filing of a continuation statement, provided this is done at least six months before the five-year period expires. It is important that the owner have the filing officer record the file. He said the UCC1 is good for five years as a notice of lien. That is correct on the state level. But remember, you are doing a non-UCC in the county level. And guess how long that lasts? Four ever. Now, would I just leave it there like that? Would I put in another one? Check with your county. Let them tell you. Let them tell you. I've had some counties tell me, you don't need to put this in again. If it's related to real property and you're protecting your house, that stands as, that stands as is with no uh, refiling requirements. But the ones that are on the Secretary of State level as a notice of lien, if they say five years, then you go ahead and do another one uh, before the, the first one expires. Just to show that that initial one in the county is still there. Date and hour of the filing on his copy of the document. Each state uses its own version of this form. Although states usually accept a generic version, they will likely charge an additional processing fee if their form is not used. Important points to understanding your straw man. The birth certificate represents the body. The SSN represents the commercial account. Behind every birth certificate is a $1 million bond, which is prepaid financing on any activity of a straw man. Some people have used their TDA to pay off their home or commercial mortgage, student loans, tax liens, or even credit card debt. I think it's safe to say that you and I are still waiting for someone to show us that this happened. It hasn't happened. Where someone can use this account to pay off debts, especially when they haven't done the correct process. Very important to understand. When you own your straw man and someone or some corporation charges against it, this is called commercial trespassing. If anyone goes after your straw man and wins any monetary award against the fiction of your straw man, then you, the real person, the secured party, get the first $1 million of that because you have the first lien. Again, the first lien is only exercised by the trust having a real promissory note recorded down at the county. That's the trust having proof that it is the creditor over that debtor. First in time, first in line. The other corporations don't have promissory notes. And so that's, yes, they can come in and, and get first dibs when it comes to bankruptcy and insolvency, uh, but the trust won't get anything because it didn't have its um, promissory note in place. So what he's stating here is incorrect. No one's gonna get the first $1 million. Where does the $1 million come from anyway? Where in law does it say 1 million is gonna go to you? a secure party creditor. Nowhere. In addition to your own freedom reclaimed, the one document preparation course. All right, so that's his video. So it's a great introduction to the subject, but it's, it's misleading. It's very misleading. It has nothing to do with the actual law here that we just saw. Um, another part of the secure party creditor process, what they do is they will, they will take the authenticated birth certificate and just come up with a number. Oh, this is backed by at least 100 million. And they'll make a $1 million bond. Now, when you look at these bonds, because there's, a, there's companies out there that does this for people and they're doing it wrong, unfortunately. And it's very misleading. When you look at what a bond is, let me zoom in here. This is uh, something you can find quickly on Google. It says that a bond is, it consists of three different parties, okay? A surety bond is a contract among at least three parties. Number one, the obligee, 
This is the party who is the recipient of an obligation. Number two, the principal, the primary party who will be performing the contractual obligation. And the surety, this is the one who assures the obligee that the principal can perform the task. So the surety is basically the insurance company. The principal would be, in this case, the debtor, you, and the obligation in their SPC process, the obligee would be the U.S. Treasury. You see, they'll create a bond representing $1 million, and they'll send that bond with the authenticated birth certificate to the U.S. Treasury, and they'll say, here's an indemnity, indemnity agreement, security agreement, saying um, you can go ahead and use this bond for whatever you want to do, but go ahead and give me the rest in a special TDA treasury account. Do you realize what you've just done? The whole point of the secure party creditor process is because the government cannot get access to the counties where the actual certificates of titles are held. They have to create a process where you go get that birth certificate, you authenticate it, you put a claim over it, and that claim is basically this indemnity agreement saying that you give them full right to use the securities that's backed up by the certificate of title. And there are securities backing it because you're going to be the ones utilizing their fiat currency. Right? Now you've given that over to the U.S. Treasury. They've re reaped the benefits. And now you're not getting anything because you didn't have a trust in play. And you're not supposed to give the birth certificate to the treasury. The money is not there. The money is down at the county. It's called the CAFR accounts, Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports. They have it. That's where it began with the birth certificate registration. That's where the money is. You sent it to the treasury. They got the money because they're broke. They're bankrupt since 1933, right? They've taught a process where they have fooled you, you have been bamboozled, and you did not give a three-party bond. You gave a two-party bond, which is basically a promissory note, a $1 million promissory note handed over to the treasury. It does you no good. How do I know that? I've seen these documents. All it has is an obligee, the U.S. Treasury, and all it has is the principal, the debtor. A real bond has to be backed by a surety. Who is the one who's going to provide the insurance in case the principal fails, the obligation? You see, you sent a promissory note. There are companies out there thinking they're putting bonds together, but they're putting together promissory notes and they're bamboozling the client. And nothing happens with those documents. It's just a selling of documents. I believe... If I am going to provide a template or a document based on my study, I will have to show you what I have studied and show you where it comes from. It's the actual law for it to make sense to you that you know what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, it is not me that stands in court for you. It is yourself. You stand on your own two feet to defend yourself and to protect your property. That's what this is all about, protecting your property and your estate. So you have to understand these terms before you do it. And when you turn over your birth certificate with these $100 million promissory notes and all of that stuff, indemnity insurance so that you can't sue them, you've helped the government, the U.S. Treasury, do what's called a legal creditor's process. This is UCC 8-112. This is what happened. The interest of a debtor in a certificated security for which the certificate is in the possession of a secure party or in an uncertificated security registered in the name of a secure party or a security entitlement, there it is, that indemnity agreement, maintained in the name of a secure party may be reached by a creditor by legal process upon the secure party. Now, why does the U.S. Treasury have the right to do this as an actual creditor? Because 
most of these SPC companies have filed Form 56, making the treasury a fiduciary to the account on their client's behalf. See, they can use this. The Form 56 is so that you can direct someone else, a third party, to have access and manage a certain account. You're doing exactly what the government has taught and what they want you to do. You're working against yourself. So just wanted to show the secure party credit process. It doesn't work. It does nothing for you. You have to only operate through contract law, through trust, because that is what the Constitution says, right? They cannot do anything that impairs the obligations of contracts. Because if they did do that, then that means we can open up their contracts and see where they have been not following their own rules. And they're not going to allow that to happen. They will honor contract law. It's the only law. So that being said, that's all for this video. It was a little bit long, but you must know what a secure party is versus a secure party creditor. There's no such thing as a secure party creditor, no SPC, none of that stuff works. It's never worked. It's just games. It places you in the category of a sovereign citizen. It places you in the category of a paper terrorist. You cannot be a sovereign citizen. That is an oxymoron. To be sovereign, you need to have your own land. You need to have your own resources on that land, gas, water, electricity, without the need of another municipality to help you with that. You need to have your own army that can support you and a treaty that backs up what the army does. You need to have gold and silver, monies and species, something that is outside of fiat currency. If you don't have those four things, and I'm sure there's more things I can list, but if you don't have those four things, you can never be sovereign. What you are is a free inhabitant on the land like the Articles of Confederation says you are. Stick to that. That makes more sense when you're going into these courtrooms. Please stay away from the SPC process. It is dangerous. It does nothing for you. It makes you look like a fool. Sorry to say, stay in trust law and contract law. If you'd like more in-depth information on this, you go ahead and go to the patreon.com forward slash the zero percent. You can enroll there in courses there made available to you. If you'd like to get an opportunity to speak with me or any of my team members who are doing consultations, please call 951-394-1775 or click the consultation link in the description below to start that right away. And we are taking consultations as of today. Today is October 5th. And I will see you in the next video. Take care.